Hey guys, welcome back to another real estate school free training brought to you by yours truly, Mr. David Dodge. I'm so excited to be here today. I'm super, super excited to be hosting my friends, uh, Felix and Daniel from OPM Mastery. And this is brought to you all by Real Estate School. So easy, we close fast and any time that works for you. Your house don't need it. We'll throw cash. It's so fast. Don't know what to do. Hey guys, welcome back to another real estate school free training brought to you by yours truly, Mr. David Dodge. I'm so excited to be here today. I'm super, super excited to be hosting my friends, uh, Felix and Daniel from OPM Mastery. And this is brought to you all by real estate school. I'm going to share my screen briefly for a second here, guys. Real estate school is my community. And as of right now, it's a free community. We have over 700 members in this community. We have a classroom within this community that offers courses on wholesaling, landlording. We have a contract generator. We have a course on real estate data. We even have a course on how to raise and utilize private money for your real estate investing business. We also have a call library. And there is an archive of every call that we've ever done here on Real Estate School. And we're constantly adding more and more of these calls to this call replay archive library. We also have a calendar here. And as you can see over the past couple months, these calendars are filled up with trainings and events. We even have a virtual RIA on Sundays. I just added a couple new uh, events here over the next couple Tuesdays and Thursdays. And again, we have ourselves a RIA on Sunday afternoons at 3 p.m. Central Time. One of the coolest things about real estate school, guys, is as of today, it's free. Now, at some point in the future, we're going to start charging. But if you are here and you are inside, you get access to real estate school for life. So if you are an early adopter and you are already in, you will never be billed. Um, in the coming weeks, we are going to start charging either a one-time fee or a monthly fee to be here. So we are excited that you guys are all here inside of Real Estate School. Um, one thing I want to mention before we move over to Felix and Daniel, you know, if you are a real estate investor and you are looking for collaboration. You are looking for joint venture partners. One of the greatest things about real estate school is you can search up at the top. So let's just say you live in Las Vegas. You can search Las Vegas and you can find community posts as well as members that are from the Las Vegas area. Obviously, you can search anything in here. You can search Alabama. You can search St. Louis. You could search Utah, right? You can search county, city, whatever. But as people join, we encourage them to fill out their bios. And the really the goal with real estate school is not only to teach you all and to have a community and to learn and have these free trainings, but also to collaborate and to joint venture with the group. All right. We also have a mastermind. There's a post at the top that's pinned. If you guys want to learn more about the mastermind, the mastermind is not free like school is today but it is super affordable. And we have a lot of people in the mastermind that are finding a lot of value. Over the last uh, four or five years, I have helped over 60 people get their first deal. And my goal is to help 600 people get their first deal. So I am super happy that you guys are here. And uh, without further ado, welcome Mr. Felix and Mr. Daniel from OPM Mastery. Guys, how the hell are you today? Doing fantastic, David. Appreciate, oh, man. The energy awesome. going. Love it. Guys, I am so happy you are here. We have been looking for somebody that can come in and help our community, help our mastermind folks, help all of our friends and fellow members of real estate school with credit repair. All right. We've had a couple other um, companies that we've partnered with in the past that, you know, help with funding. Um, and I know you guys can help with that too, but specifically, I really want to dive deep into the whole credit thing, the issue of credit, how to build it, how to repair it, how to utilize credit to build our businesses. So again, I am, I'm pumped you guys are here. So welcome. And um, I'm going to shut up and let you guys <laughs> take over. I will be here, of course, to help guys and girls. We will have a Q and a at the end of the call. 
The, the goal here today would be about 45 minutes of training and then 15 more minutes of Q&A, you know, if needed, of course. If you have questions during their presentation, drop them in the chat. And then towards the end of the call, we will open it up and you guys can, you know, share your, your mics. You can, you know, if you're, if you're able to turn your cameras on, I'd love to see you guys. Obviously, if you're driving or doing other things, no big deal. It's not required, but I love to see you guys face to face here. So if you can turn your cameras on, I'd appreciate it. And again, without further ado, Felix and Daniel, you guys have the floor, my friends. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Well, to get started, we're going to have Mr. Felix take off here, kind of give you a little bit more information about our company, our Valley Systems, and how uh, we're here to help, guys, and how we're here to serve. Awesome. Awesome, guys. So if you guys can just first turn off the camera, I just want to make it pretty interactive. I want to see everybody's beautiful faces. And Agreed. Everybody that's part of this community, I think you guys have a you know, pretty, um, you know, close niche community. I'm just super excited to see, you know, what we can teach you more of like understanding credit, building credit, and ultimately leveraging that to kind of like into more deal flows or to create wealth, right? So that would be kind of like one of the main principles that we focus on today. Cool. So starting off, just to give you guys some context. Um, so Daniel is a partner of our company as well, OPM Mastery, but we're basically, you know, we help a lot of people with credit repair funding. And then it's one of our main goals to really help revamp how we view credit as kind of like a tool when it comes to leveraging that to create more wealth, right? Because one of the biggest beliefs growing up is that we typically view debt as kind of like a bad thing through our parents, through you know, education, do going to college, school, and we don't really understand kind of like the strategic overview of how we can take advantage of it and then, you know, use it to our advantage to invest into things like real estate in this case, right? So what we're going to start with is kind of like what we call our simple four-step framework on how we leverage other people's money to scale a business, fund more deals, and create more income in as little as two months or less, or in this case, 45 days or less, right? So Daniel, if you want to kind of, like, you know, talk about the formula that we created and then just go from there into, you know, the credit building aspect of it. Yeah, absolutely. So as far as good credit, right, the, the first thing is if you don't have good credit, that's why we're here to talk about how to build it and how to build the habits along the way. So a lot of people maybe aren't ready for the funding step yet, which is what we talked about, right, which is okay. So you want to do two things during this time. You want to build out your business credit as, as a first thing. And the second thing is you want to take the steps on the personal credit to start making sure that you're in position to actually access funding. And a lot of people undervalue how, how powerful it is uh, because they assume that, hey, you know what, I have to have a business that's already operating, I have to have all this money that's already being made. But it starts with your personal credit score and your personal score will usually need to make sure that there's, you know, any derogatories taken off of that, right? So once that you have that leverage, and you're able to access this business credit, right, but personal credit comes first. Um, then you can go ahead and borrow against it. And the, the beautiful thing we know about this is that because it's on the business side, because you built your personal side good, because there's no derogatories, none of that stuff shows up on your personal score. So you're able to leverage this money, get it, help you close more deals as you guys are already doing, right? Without it affecting your personal score. So sometimes if you need to uh, apply for traditional loans or stuff or lines, you're not affecting utilization, you're not affecting DTI. Um, and you know, you just have to be a little bit creative about how you source the funding, which we could talk about a little bit more at the end. Uh, Felix, if you go to the next slide here, I don't have slide control here. Cool. So why, right? Why does this even matter? Why does this even make sense? Well, so when you do have bad credit, I know we all see this, right? I know they say, Hey, you know, well, you're going to pay more interest, but I don't know if you guys actually know how much it costs you to have bad credit, right? So the average interest paid um, on a $250,000 house goes as follows, depending on where your score is at, right? And guys, when's the last time we've even seen these rates? If, if you guys if you guys are in the real estate space, right? You guys, I'm sure, can tell me when the last time you've even seen a 4% interest rate or a 5% interest rate. That's pretty low according to what's going on today in the marketplace. So these are a little bit older numbers, obviously. But even in these numbers, you're paying upwards of $200,000 in interest. 
on a $250,000 home. That's not a big home, guys. That's not. So imagine what happens when you're getting into deals and you're doing traditional financing, but you're you're getting three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars properties. How much interest is being paid because of the bad credit, right? So I want to go into the breakdown of what is building your score exactly and how important each part of that score is. So between right. the 760 and the 850, the high end, the interest on 250 would be 190. But on the lower end here, the 620 to 640, essentially, you'd be at 280,000. Guys, that's a hundred grand almost more you're going to pay by not having good credit. And here's something else that I'm sure these guys are super familiar with too. But your credit not only affects the interest rate on which you borrow at, but it also affects stuff like the rate... In, the, the the insurance premiums that you may have on your mm -hmm. properties and other things as well, right? So having good credit is so important. I think right now I have 38 or 39 loans right now, yep. the banks. Um, it's, a, it's 120 units total. So some of these loans have five and six properties on them. And I owe the banks about $7 million. And I'm looking at my credit score right <laughs> this moment. It's 773. Two weeks, ago, two weeks ago, it was 813. And the <laughs> reason it dropped a little bit is because I, I spend a little bit of money on my credit cards that I got to pay off here in the next couple of days. But I am looking at my credit score, guys. I got a little app and it's maybe kind of hard to see here. We can we can circle back. But I track it daily, literally yeah. daily. If, if not daily, a couple of times a week, I'm looking at it and I get notifications as well. So I just I can't emphasize enough how important it is to have good credit or to be aware at a minimum of your credit and your credit score and be making decisions daily and in real time that will affect your credit score in a positive directory. Guys, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just, I'm you're passionate good. about this and it's, no, you're good. <laughs> I wanted to throw that out there. Cool. Well, Go ahead, life, David, I will tell you this life is way more expensive when you have bad credit in general. Right. So we we're just talking about way more difficult. It's way more expensive. All the above. Yeah. And then you got, you got car insurance, interest on your car, right? You got to set up internet, electricity, water, everything is so much more expensive with bad credit. And sometimes we don't really see it. And it causes this hamster wheel effect. And why a lot of people can't invest is because their credit's bad because they they're being taken money from everywhere else. Right. And the average person has a discretionary discretionary of at least an extra four to six hundred dollars a month just by having good credit. That's the average person. Right. And that might not sound like a lot, but, you know, a couple thousand dollars a year is a big deal. So they can start investing in their information and they can now leverage. Right. So that I mean, you're you're right on it. Right. You're you're absolutely a thousand percent on it. Uh, yeah, please, sir. Yes, sir. Agreed. And I think statistically speaking, too, in in your lifetime, if you have bad credit, you're probably paying over like five hundred dollars in and like interest all, across all the different debt that it takes out, right? So the purpose of kind of like everything that we're teaching you today is understanding that some of these things can be fixed by doing simple tweaks, and as long as you commit the time and invest the time in doing so, this will help you save so much money down the line, right? Absolutely, guys, hundred percent. Cool. So obviously we know guys that there's a difference between good debt and bad debt. We understand that, you know, liabilities aren't going to make you money, which is why you guys are in real estate. It's a great idea. You guys are already in the right direction, right? Uh, but that that's what, I mean, David was just talking about 7 million in debt. That's the rich dad, poor dad strategy. It's acquiring debt and leveraging it to continue making money. The one thing I want to point out in that is that we're leveraging debt. We're borrowing money. Why do we borrow money, guys? We borrow money because it's tax free. That's one of the wealth seekers that you guys have, but you can only access that by understanding how to manipulate your credit score, right? So we're going to go into the breakdowns of the scores. We're going to go into what matters, what's what can be fixed, what's what's easier to recover and, and kind of go from there, right? So utilization number is number one. So utilization is going to be one of the primary things that's going to roller coaster your credit score. So you're going to have highs, you're going to have lows, you're going to, it's all going to be dependent on what your personal utilization is on the credit cards. And for those of you who may be a little bit newer to this side of things, utilization is just the amount of cards that you're using. So if you have a $10,000 card and you're using $3,000 of it, that is 30% utilization. So generally speaking, as long as you stay under 30%, your score will still be pretty good. Overall, you'll still be very optimal. You'll still be in a position to acquire funds, right? So um, anything obviously under that is even better. So 10 to 30% is great. Under 10% is fantastic. 1% uh, is better than 0%. That's a whole other thing. But 
Uh, utilization staying will under help. 30 is so important. I just made a payment. You guys probably can't yeah. see it on my card because I got to keep it under 30%. You have to. Got to keep it under 30%, folks, if you want to have good credit. I yeah. can't now, emphasize that enough. It's so, so important. Watch, David, I'm, I'm going to tell you one of the biggest mistakes. I didn't mean to cut you up, but I want to tell you no, one you're of the good. biggest mistakes when it comes to utilization. And this happens every single day. I see it every single day. People pay off their cards every single month, but but their score still sucks. And they have no idea why. And they look at their credit and they have a 50% utilization and they don't understand. And the reason is because your due date on your credit card and the reporting date that it sends to the credit bureaus is different. And a lot of people don't notice that. So what happens is your due date might be on the 15th, but you might be at 60, 70, 80% utilization on the 7th. And the 7th is when the credit bureaus get the update. And so you need to find that out. I'm going to talk about how to check that out, guys. But that that's usually like if someone doesn't have like derogatories on their score, that's usually a very easy fix to get them in a good position to get their score, right? So very, very important. It's really small. It's, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but it is, right? Okay. So number yeah. two. So this uh, on-time payment is very um, de deceptive, okay? And the reason I say it's very deceptive is because it can also be considered a derogatory mark. And I say that is because on-time payments, although it says, hey, it's, you know, about 17% of your score, it is when it's positive, okay? So it is when it's positive. And so the way I want you to think about on-time payments is, you guys all went to school at some point in your life, okay? Um, you either had an A, B, C, D, or F, right? You had grades. So when it comes to on-time payments, there's only two grades. You either have an A or an F. <laughs> a is 100% payment on-time history, and an F is 99. Yeah, okay? and that's so to... true, guys. You got to stay on this. That's yes. why I look at mine several times a week, literally. I'd say three or four times a week, I'm checking it. I'm looking at it because it's a difference of millions of dollars over a lifetime, not just 500 a week or a month, right? It's millions of dollars over a lifetime, if you're buying and selling a lot of real estate and taking out a lot of loans and, and using credit, which you should, because it's going to make you rich, millions of dollars, right? So you got to stay on top of it. Daniel, thank you. Absolutely. No, you're, I mean, you're, again, you're right on the money that this is actually one of the biggest detrimental factors that stops people from acquiring funding. So <clears throat> sometimes we have collections and things like that, and that can be worked on. But if you have too many late payments and it's the account is open, it's really hard to get those off. And that's usually one of the biggest impacts to actually being able to borrow money. <clears throat> so again, on-time payments, again, you want to have 100%. Guys, set the minimum payments. Forget about it. Just make sure that you have it on no matter what, whether it's $35, whatever it is. And then also keep in mind, um, you're not going to get a late payment by being one day late. Okay. It's going to be 30 days late. So people tell me, oh, I just forgot. No, you did not. It was over 30 days late. You need to be mindful of your credit. So people tell you, mind your business. I want you to mind your business when it comes to credit. It's your business. It's your credit. Super, super important. I know we're focused on that one a lot, but if you mess that up, that one's a lot harder to fix. Can it be fixed? Yes. Everything has a solution, but it takes time and work. And sometimes we want to move a little bit faster than that. So as long as you take care of on-time payments, you're going to be in a pretty good position overall. Um, number three, derogatory marks. So these are negatives. These are collections. These are charge-offs. These are these can also be considered late payments, right? Um, these are bankruptcies. All these will have impacts on you guys' score. And if you guys will notice, if you guys have ever had this at some point in your life, you'll notice that, you know, the first one uh, greatly decreases the score, Right. But then when you have two, three, four more, and people have different stories of what happens for them, right? And all of a sudden, their score doesn't really drop that much more. And so I want you to think about it in the reverse. When that profile is being repaired, even though you're deleting things, you know, it only takes one to detrimentally drop that score and stop you from being able to access funds. So you want that profile to be very clean. You want to know what's going on with your profile. And how do you check it, right? So someone, uh, Jordan here mentioned, do you check your score through credit card? Okay. So Credit Karma can give you an accurate idea of what is reporting on your score, but is not the accurate representation of what your score is. And here's why. People say, well, is it more accurate or less accurate than Experian? It's not that it's less accurate. It's a whole different scoring system. Okay. So they use a Vantage score. And there's nothing wrong with Vantage scores. We just don't use them when it comes to credit card or mortgages generally. Right? Let me ask you this, guys. When you go into a bank and you get a loan to buy a piece of real estate, are they using that? No. They're using a, a mortgage FICO, usually a mortgage FICO 5 or a FICO 4. 
right? Which is also different from a FICO 8, which is what's used for credit cards. So it's completely different. And the reason that people get a very misunderstanding of what their credit looks like is because the Vantage score is just a different formula. It's still different, a credit score, right? But they reward you for paying off collections, okay? They reward you for it. Guess what? FICO does not. You can pay off a collection. Your FICO generally won't increase that much. You want it gone from your credit report in order for it to increase, right? So different things like that. And then age, right? So age, yes, you can help this by having an authorized user. But at the end of the day, what the reality is for a FICO A and moving on to the new FICOs uh, that will be coming out in, in the future, they're looking at your personal history. So the banks are smart. Even though you can artificially increase your score to 800, that doesn't mean you actually have an 800. So that's why we're teaching you these data points to understand why this is so important. And, and um, when you have a credit line and you have a credit card, don't go crazy applying for cards if you don't know what you're doing. I'm letting you know that right now, because what you're doing is you're cutting the age of the file. So what I don't want people doing is getting a card, waiting three to six months, getting another card, waiting three to six months, getting another card. So every single time that's happening, you're just chopping the history quarterly, right? And you're not allowing the history to actually build up. It's a better thing to go get three, four cards at the same time and then let them all build at the same time and not touch them for a year or two years. Then go back in and you can get increases without doing these hard inquiries, right? There's, there's still ways to access more credit lines, but that's really a way that's going to maximize how much lines of credit you get, how much age you get to build and how it's reflected on your score, right? So just keep that in mind. Total accounts. In order to get to an 800, you got to have multiple lines of credit like David, right? There's no way to get past the 800 without having it. So people say, well, Daniel, I only have, I only want one or two or three cards, but I want an 850 credit score. It's not going to happen. You need to have multiple lines because it shows that you're responsible with different lines of credit, not just credit cards, not just loans, lines of credit, all of that in between. And then inquiries. Okay. So inquiries, um, isn't necessarily a terrible thing once you're at a certain level, okay? When you're at the level of David, everyone will let you borrow anyways, okay? I have clients, you know, once they've made it through funding, they have 70, 80 inquiries and they're still getting approved for loans, okay? And they're getting great rates. However, at the beginning, you want to be under that five mark. You want to be underlying because you have not proven yourself yet. And so what happens is if you have too many inquiries and you go to these banks, well, it's not even that your credit score may be bad. Look at that. Beautiful. <laughs> there you go. Look, FICO 8. FICO 8. That's what I'm talking about. That's 818, what baby. I got an 818. That's what we're yeah, talking buddy. about. Right? So when, when you have these inquiries, right, and you're going to these bank, what's, what's happening is they're looking at it, right? Imagine you have an 818, right? And Or maybe let's say a little lower. Let's say 750, 760. And you go in. It's still good, which it's is great. still phenomenal. great, by the way. So phenomenal. Anything above 750 is pretty damn good, right? Phenomenal. So watch this. Right. But you have 40 inquiries on there and you run application. You're not getting an instant approval anymore. Because of how many inquiries you have, you're triggering a flag for the bank to look at you and say, hmm, well, there's a lot of banks that have been running their credit and we don't see all those banks that gave them loans. So and that could have been because you decided not to take it, right? But it doesn't matter because the bank says, well, why didn't they give them a loan? Is there something that we didn't see that we're missing? And now they're doing the manual manual review. And now that doesn't mean you're not going to get approved, but it makes things harder when it's not necessary, right? So if you want to know what your FICO looks like, go pull your Experian. Guys, go pull all three reports. Yes, it costs money. Absolutely. But it's going to be an accurate representation of where your score is. You get one a year from each data. of them for free? Don't, do not do you or not? I thought you, you can. I don't so know. You, I'm asking. You can I'm go, asking. Yeah, you can go to myfreecreditreport.com and it'll give you one. Um, one, but it's right. usually advantage score. It's not FICO either. But guys, so, most banks nowadays, like the one I just showed you was from the Bank of America app. I don't pay monthly or annually to have them um, be able to, you know, or for me to be able to access it. Um, and I know there's a lot of credit card companies out there as well that will give you access to your FICO score by being a customer. So there's a couple of different ways to go about doing it, but I'm not discounting what Daniel just said either. What was that website again, Daniel? Well, Experian.com or MyFICO. By the way, Experian.com, Experian is free, but it costs money to get the other two bureaus, okay? Got it, got it. Okay, good to know. And, and once you do have a good credit score, you're going to want one of these anyways because you want the identity theft protection. It's Correct. worth it. Right? Yeah, and that's Both what my credit card gives me. It gives me, exactly. I think it's 250K, I think, don't quote me on that, of protection. Yeah. Um, and I pay, I think I pay 12 bucks a month to up it because I think you get 25,000, included but i wanted to, to go higher just because i don't want any issues guys yeah. but it's the best hundred bucks i spend a year basically yeah. 
you know, but again, neither here nor there. Dan, no, and there, all those are great points. All those are great points. And then, um, and then obviously, you know, you can, you experience gives you up to a million, I believe in identity. Oh, even that. better. I, maybe I should check it out. Yeah. Awesome. So it, it's, it's like 29 bucks, 30 bucks, right? So these things are worth it once your credit's good. So we don't care about these things until we have good credit, right? But we Correct. should start caring about them now to make sure we have those foundations and habits, right? Um, but we can help you guys remove these inquiries, right? Whether it's through repair or we, I mean, for a lot of our investors, we have scripts where we can get inquiries off within 48 hours. Now, you only want to remove accounts that are not connected to these uh, inquiries that are not connected to accounts, right? So I don't want to go open a Bank of America card and then go delete the inquiry for it. That's just asking for trouble, okay? But maybe I was shopping around. I was getting a couple of quotes. I had three, four, five inquiries that I didn't use. You don't want those on your report, right? So you want to be able to remove those to make sure that you're increasing. Even if it's just a little bit, getting that point increase, it's important because when you do run again, you're going to get a nice drop again, right? So these are all parts of it um, when it comes to repair, guys. And everybody has a different file. Everyone has a different thing to look at. One thing I will emphasize that's extremely important about where you look at doing repair is you want to do repair with a company that does funding. And here's the reason why. So there's two ways to do repair. There's very aggressive ways to do credit repair, okay? Um, and the thing that happens with that is it set clients up for failure when it comes to funding because of how they do it. They delete way too much personal information. They set up too many fraud alerts. And all of a sudden, every time you're trying to do any type of application, you're having to call in, send an ID. They don't believe you. You're getting a decline first, and then you have to call in for a reapproval. And you're getting another hard inquiry just to get the same card because no one understood the funding process afterwards, right? And so this is stuff that's important. When you're cleaning a report, you want to do it right to where they can still have success long-term. And again, if you're only cleaning a report to clean it because you want okay credit, cool. Plenty of companies can do that. But if you will have a different uh, goal in mind afterwards, that's where it's important. And I'm not just saying with us overall, there are a couple of companies, if they do both, they understand what the holistic view on credit looks like. Yeah. Good to know. Good to know. So, so in conclusion, here's kind of like the biggest three takeaway for you guys to start tweaking your credit score is number one, understanding what your payment due date is versus your reporting date. And the way that you guys can check that for free is just go to your credit karma and click on those individual credit revolving accounts of yours, right? It will literally tell you the date that it reports the balance from that credit card company over to that credit bureaus. Did so anybody you, know that here? I didn't know that. It's crazy. Right? I didn't know that. I, I thought I knew a thing or two account. about credit. I had no idea that that was different. I figured it was, did they make their payment or not? Mm -hmm. It's a different date. Who would have known? It's crazy. crazy. And it makes such a big difference because you never know what your utilization is until you actually check your reporting date for those individual accounts, right? Yeah. One of the things that I try to do diligently, guys, is I don't ever make my payment when it's due. I make my payment when I have the money to pay it. Think about that for a second, right? If you had an extra three or 500 or some cases, 10 grand laying around, whatever, and you got some credit card debt, don't wait till the due date, pay it as soon as you can. Even if it's just a couple hundred dollars or in some cases, $50, right? And also if you're making these payments more often, right? It's going to help reduce the amount that's, that's utilized by the time that date comes versus you just paying it after it. It's just, you know, it's also just one of these things like you want to try to increase your financial IQ and mm -hmm. credit is a big part of that. So again, don't mean to interrupt you guys. I'm just, I'm passionate <laughs> about this. Guys. I'm it. passionate about it. <laughs> Love it. Oh, and the number two, just make sure that you guys go into all your credit card accounts and then set up minimum payments. Cause as we start getting more loans and we start managing more credit cards, I like auto pay you're saying. Yeah, auto pay, yep. auto pay on the minimum. You don't have to pay off the full balance, but it just sets the nature of, you know, every single month, it's just going to deduct like 10% of the total balance from your checking account and you don't have to worry about it, right? Because the last thing you want is just one late payment on your credit report and it drops your score significantly where it took you, you know, years and years to build it. So, so keep that in mind. And then number three is inquiries. If you guys have a lot of inquiries over like 10 on each credit bureau, do look into kind of like working with us on that or even consider disputing it yourself because that would make a big impact when you guys do try to get like a car loan or like a real estate loan, personal loan or apply for like personal or business credit cards in that case, right? So that's the beef, um, top three takeaways, I would say. Amazing. Cool. 
So now we understand more of like the nature of like building personal credit, why it's so important when it comes to, you know, um, accessing capital. And now we transition more of like understanding business credit, right? Because business credit is a whole another world that you guys need to understand. And there's so much advantages behind it. Number one, whatever business credit account that you acquire, it's not going to report on your personal credit report, right? So once I learned that, it allows me to really, you know, be a little bit more risky in the type of investment that I make, knowing that it's not going to impact my personal credit, right? So as long as you have the habit of paying down your cards, maintain a good credit score, now you can kind of like transition over to business credit and add leverage to that, right? So that's pretty much what we're going to be talking about um, in this next module. And guys, I want to just mention one thing real quick to, to, to our group here. There's the only difference between personal credit and business credit is are they lending you or are giving you lines of credit in your social security number or are they doing it in your EIN number? As a business owner, even if you have a trust, you often have an EIN number. But as any business, right, if you want to go get a bank account, you're going to also need to have an EIN number, right? And this is essentially how the IRS knows who to tax. Are they taxing David or are they taxing household easy properties, right? Mm -hmm. It's one or the other. So the business credit is going to go through an EIN number where a personal credit card is going to go through a social security number. That's the only difference here. Don't let that confuse you. I get asked that all the time. What's the difference? What's the difference? It's not very different, in my opinion, other than how they are picking it. Now, there's going to be a lot of little things, of course, right? But the yeah. highest level looking down, it's either a social security number or an EIN number. It's that simple. Guys, take it away. Yeah, yeah. So what Dave is saying is for, for that specific um, type of funding, it will be more on like after you build out your business credit in a sense, right? But for someone that is just starting out their business, but they want access to capital and also take advantage of like, you know, not having a report on your personal credit and having huge credit limits. As and there are advantages. Of cards. Yep. Yeah. You, you can, you can leverage your personal credit to acquire these business credit cards. Right. And these are kind of like the five reasons why I decided to kind of like fully focus on leveraging, you know, my personal credit to obtain these sort of business products in the first place. Got it. Number one, there's little to no risk in terms of the interest that's being occurred on there. Right. So for me specifically, we're it. For all investors, when it comes to this, we're in the game of like margins, right? How much can we borrow at what cost and how much can we make with the money that we borrow and, you know, the return that we accumulate from that, right? So if I'm borrowing money at a 0% interest rate, I know for a fact I'm confident in investing that into like the stock market, S&P 500 that yields a 9% average rate of return. Or if you're confident in your deal flows and how much you're making in terms of your track record, then it's a no-brainer for you to borrow money from the bank that offered these 0% interest type of products, right? So this is where a lot of my focus kind of like diverted into these sort of business credit cards is because business credit cards, number one, don't report on personal credit report. Number two, it's literally free interest. You don't pay any interest on it for anywhere between 12 to 24 months if you understand the different products out there right? And then number three, they usually give you a huge credit limit as compared to personal credit, just because they know it's for business purposes in that sense, right? So, and then let alone the free rewards and cash back, I think Daniel and I, um, due the time that we leverage our business credit cards to get into real estate or to invest in our company, we never paid a single dime for like travel in that case, right? So, we also try to understand the travel game behind it because you start accumulating all these free points through using business credit cards strategically. You can convert that into first class travel, free flights, free hotels, and it, it, it's pretty much just killing two birds in one stone. In this I case. went to Hawaii last month, stayed at the Ritz Carlton for six days, mm -hmm. probably $12,000 trip. I didn't pay a dollar, guys. It was all points from my business credit cards. We buy mm -hmm. a lot of materials with these business credit cards and we're racking up points every day. And it's just another advantage to be able to, to using these cards and gaining these points. At the end of the day, I could have just paid cash for all the paint, mm -hmm. and drywall and flooring, but I use a business credit card and then I pay it off. So I don't even have to pay any interest. Yeah. It's just how you're using these things. But who doesn't want to go spend six days in Hawaii at the Ritz, right? For free. Free. And, and David, that's, that's such a big cards. part, especially as being a real estate investor, because 
you know, sometimes you got to go out to different states and you have deals in different places. Sometimes it, it makes sense for you to go out there and go look at these properties or spend time out there when a project's being done. So when you can fly there for free, when you can, when you get to, you know, you get to stay in the lounges as you're going, it makes it to so you're still working, you're staying in your hotel, it's all covered. It makes it efficient and inexpensive for you to do your business. You know what I mean? And let's not, let's mm-hmm. not uh, discount the fact that when we're using our business credit cards on business expenses, it helps with taxes because these can be expenses or write-offs or deductions or however you want to define it against your income, right? So you don't want to be commingling your personal credit and your business credit. Yeah. And you can, but it's not recommended by any means because it's just going to make it more difficult when it comes to the bookkeeping and year-end tax filing and so on and so forth. <clears throat> yeah. And, and, then, and I'll say something. Go ahead, Felix. Go ahead. Yeah. And I'll say this is kind of like my biggest, um, biggest takeaway from learning about business credit is because the concept of, you know, who you know, or your network is your network, right? So this same applies in the finance world too, right? So basically, when you acquire these business credit cards, and you're building some sort of business credit under your business, doing whatever venture or investing that you're doing, you're building a network of lenders at the same time, and you're building a track record based on the credibility on how often you pay off these cards, right? So look at a lot of these bankers as kind of like your partner for life, because they're the one that's going to be supplying capital for you deal over deal over deal, as long as you build some sort of track record. But if you're not willing to start that or even build some sort of business credit, you wouldn't have those foundation kind of like set, um, set forward when it comes to, you know, the success of your business and raising more capital in that sense, right? So I would say the biggest takeaway is is building a foundation, a track record of your performance with business debt. Therefore, it gives you access and opportunities to other lenders, which then gives you leverage because now you can negotiate with other lenders on lower interest rates, right? So look at that as kind of like a partnership that you're building with those banks. But yeah, no, Daniel, um, I know you have something to add on. Oh, no, no. It's just a quick note. I, a lot of these other questions we're going to answer more towards the end. But uh, the quick note that Ro mentioned is that some business card report of both. Yeah, they do. You don't want those cards because if you need to leverage business expenses, there will be times in your business where you're going to be maxed out on a card. Yeah, or, if- or just have high utilization, 30, 40, 50, 80, exactly. maybe 100 in some cases for short periods of time. Exactly. Great point. I am so glad that we're talking about that. And that's okay to yes. do it for short periods of time with your business credit, just exactly. not your personal. Guys, I can't emphasize yeah. this enough. Not with your personal credit. 30% exactly. is the max. Do not let it go above it. Not even for a day. Pay it off and then use it. <laughs> All right. If you want to get if you want to save millions of dollars over the lifetime, you got to focus on the personal credit being I. Exactly. So in that case, for example, like the Capital One business credit card, it's one of the main reasons we don't recommend that for people um, because it reports. Now, if if they really need to get it, okay, they don't really have a lot of options. Maybe the profile really isn't that strong, but it's not recommended. So you do want to know which cards do report and which ones don't. Um, and you want you want to stay away, um, stay away from them. And Jordan, believe it or not, so you don't always know. You need to have a lot of data points. You gotta. You just need to be able to have leverage and to be able to pull that information. You gotta do a lot of research. Um, but most of the bigger banks won't, except for obviously Capital One, that example. But anyways, back to you, Felix. I know I want to make sure we get through this on time and still have time to answer the rest of these questions here. Yeah, for sure. So just want to give you guys kind of like two examples of like different real estate investors that we worked with in the past when it comes to acquiring specifically zero percent business credit, right? So a lot of times people are under the impression, you know, in order for me to access business credit at no interest and get up to $100,000, $150,000 funded, I need to make sure that I have some sort of track record in terms of revenue generated within the business or been in business for over five years to qualify. That is honestly not the case because a lot of that really comes down to where your personal credit is standing. And as long as you have an EIN that's open for one year under that business, Rather it's revenue, rather you have employees, whatnot, you are still qualified for these cards, right? Um, So really kind of like shift your belief from that. A lot of times you don't need to be too qualified within the business to access the capital that you need. But as long as you understand kind of the requirements that comes into it, and then most importantly, just your credit score, making sure that is in the best state possible, and then having a business that's over one year, 
rather it's making revenue or not leveraging the system and the processes that we use to get funding is ultimately kind of like the formula on raising capital on that end right cool so we're just going to talk a little bit more about the three different phrases so number one is to make sure that you optimize your credit right so i recommend having over a 720 plus fico score just because of everything that's going on with the economy just because of the unlimited printing that we've been doing in the past couple of years banks are starting to kind of like tightening up their you know limitations on who they accept when it comes to business funding so you want to make sure that you go above and beyond on your credit to make sure that when you bring this credit report to the bank and you bring your credit score that they see you as kind of, kind of like a you know bar that has a good track record based on everything that's happening in the economy so what does that look like basically having more than five open accounts on your credit report that shows that you're a seasoned borrower having less than three inquiries in the past six months showing that you're not really seeking too much credit in the past given months but now you're just exploring different opportunities with other banks and then making sure that you have a clean payment history and under 30 percent utilization now you meet all of those requirements. This is phase two, where I'm sure a lot of you guys already started your rental property LLC or your real estate LLC. Here is kind of like a big takeaway for you guys. And, you know, I, I learned from experience is banks hate it, hate to lend to um, real estate companies. So if you have anything like um, real estate corporation as your business name, a lot of times that's going to flag their system right off the bat and their algorithm is basically going to lower the chances of you getting approved. So what you want to pay attention when you guys create your LLC is to keep it generalized. So for example, I list my business and it's a real estate management company as Felix and Associates. I don't put like Felix Rentals LLC in this case, right? I keep it generalized. You can use Felix Management LLC, Felix Enterprise in this case. But make sure the keyword is, yeah, the keyword within the name is going to play a big influence on the way that the bank looks at you and your business and how risky it can be. Right? That's right. That's right. And my friend Ryan Anderson's on this call here today. He's with Prime Corporate Services, guys, and they can help you set up those LLCs as well. Um, so if you guys need help with that, just send me a DM over in school and I can connect you with my friend, Ryan. He's a great guy. He'll help you with those things. Um, and that's specifically for the mm -hmm. LLC creation for sure. Awesome. Yeah. And cool. then so phase two, two is the funding. I love it. Phase three scaling. Who doesn't want to scale? <laughs> <laughs> cool. So now you have your LLC. This is where you can start taking advantage of your personal credit and the LLC that's in place to apply for funding under you. Um, under right yes so sir. basically meeting all of those requirements you can be eligible for both personal credit cards and business credit card funding but you want to put more emphasis on the business credit card just for the nature that it doesn't report on your personal credit bureaus right cool amazing yeah so a lot of times people would just come to us and say you know why am i constantly getting denied aside from like having good credit and then making sure my business is in place and there are a lot of other factors that we're not aware of number one kind of like the keyword within your business name that plays a really important role right so making sure that it's generalized in that case is going to help out a lot and then number two is your next code so that's what we call our naics code it's pretty much a code it's pretty much when you set up a business, they're going to ask you what industry you fall under. So you never want to, you know, put yourself under real estate, construction, any businesses that requires high operating costs or risky or involved in a lot of chargebacks within the industry. You would never want to classify your business under that. But instead, you want to list yourself, for example, like a management company, a consulting company or an e-commerce company, because normally these business industries or these classification of businesses has you know good margins and they cash flow pretty well right so the way that you structure your business is very important and the way that the, these lenders look at you is just as important based on you know these little information that we're giving you today right um and yeah and then i just want to dive into you know let's just say you set up everything you have a good credit report you want to start raising capital or getting funding there's three types of funding that you guys need to under, understand. And the one that we focus on is what we call no-doc loans, right? 
So a lot of times when you try to apply for a personal loan or business loans, they would typically ask for two years of tax returns, six months of bank statements to really evaluate the financial status of your business, right? We want to avoid any of that because our main purpose here is to help you bridge the gap in getting the lowest interest capital as quickly as possible without being without putting too much work within the business, right? So when it comes to no doc loans, the only thing that you need is a great personal credit report, right? And so I get a lot of loans that are no doc, DSCR loans. I work with mm -hmm. a couple of different lenders, Aloha, Renovo, uh, Lending One, Lending Home, Kiavi, you name it. Even sometimes with my local banks and credit unions, we'll, we'll go with yeah. the DSCR approach. And uh, guys, the most important part of that is the deal in your credit. They're not looking yeah. at my taxes. They're not looking at my P&Ls typically. They're like, what's your credit? And when I show them my 818, they're like, yeah, we want to work with you, right? So it's just, it's one of these things where this isn't cre credit, not, you know, credit repair is one thing, but just credit IQ and being aware and just knowing what to do and probably more importantly, what not to do is a daily routine. It's not just a one-time thing, right? It's something that we want to be cognizant mm -hmm. of every day, all day. And even when I'm in the store making buying and purchasing decisions, you know, which card I want to use or, you know, how I'm going to spend my money is it matters, right? So you just want to try to elevate your financial IQ. And again, this is a big piece of it, guys. Yeah. So really understanding the different lenders, different products that are considered no document loans, and that's solely based on your personal credit is very important, right? And then obviously there's low doc loans and full doc loans, and those involve paperwork, financial statements, P&L, and that's normally when you try to apply for like commercial financing or SBA loans, they would require like a business plan, and it just takes months and months and months to kind of like go through that process, that underwriting, and let alone knowing if you get approved or not, and then let alone knowing if the deal still stands from that point on, right? So the biggest bet that you guys can make and the biggest opportunity cost is obviously finding the lenders and the type of products that are considered no doc and solely based on your personal credit in this case, right? Amazing, amazing. Cool. Um, but we'll we'll skip through everything in the next five minutes and then we can do... Um, uh, yeah, there's no problem. Let's wrap, let's, let's wrap through, wrap it up, and then we can jump into the Q&A because I'm sure we're going to have a lot of questions from our, our audience here today. Cool. Awesome. And I'm sure a lot of you guys are kind of like questioning, okay, cool. I can get all of these business credit cards, but how do I use that to invest into real estate, right? So, Daniel, I'll let you, I'll let you do this one because I know that's something you're super passionate about. <laughs> All right, guys. So I'm going to teach you a hack. Um, this is not a DSCR loan. This is not a any other type of loan. This is a, I have really good credit, but I have no other money loan. Okay. Um, <laughs> and what you want to do is you want to, let's say you go ahead and acquire 50 to 80,000 and 0% interest business credit cards, which is not a huge amount. It's very reasonable as long as you have a good FICO and decent credit lines already. Um, so what you would do is you want to structure this right, depending on the type of loan you're going to get approved for. So some people might do like non-QM loans. They're going to do 20% downs. Um, and that's fine. There's not really a lot of questions asked. You can liquidate from your card and you can go ahead and access the property. Everyone knows that that's simple, but what if I'm trying to qualify for a 5% down or a 10% down, or, you know, I mean, maybe I want to live in the home a little bit while I'm rebuilding it out. I'm doing a 3.5, right? but I still need this down payment. I'm getting into a bigger property and I want to do a lower down payment. So I'm going to have these funds sourced. I'm going to have my, make sure I have my merchant account. Okay. And then and now people are like, well, Daniel, I already know that I can advance from my merchant account too. Yes, but no, you're not going to do that. What you're going to do is you're going to add an authorized user on that business credit card prior to trying to liquidate anything. And then you're going to charge that authorized user of the funds. Number one, because they're not responsible for it. But number two, because your name won't show up on the merchant account. So therefore, you're not triggering any flags and they're not going to get mad at you for cash advancing because they know what the trick is, right? Everyone knows that they can just charge themselves on their credit card to pull out money. They understand that. So you don't want your, your personal name, even though it's your card. So again, no one's getting any type of liability on their end because they're not the ones being used, right? Um, but uh, it's your card. It's your responsibility, all that good stuff. And it's not reporting to the personal credit report, okay? Uh, that's the first part. So funds go into that into that merchant account. Merchant account pays to the business account. Business account can now pay to you as the executive owner or as an employee on a W-2, whichever one you go. The reason you do this is because your, your funds are now sourced. 
and they have history and they're traceable, right? So they're never a big, uh, the the lender is never going to ask you. I want the exact invoice from the client that paid for this, and they could, but you would have it if you needed to, right? But it usually wouldn't get to that point. But what didn't happen is you didn't have twenty, thirty thousand dollars of brand new money in your bank account, and they have no idea where it came from because you can't use those funds to close on a property, right? So by doing this, it allows you to leverage and still buy property. This works really well for multi homes or usually short term rentals. I don't necessarily recommend this for a lot of other deals or even flips. But basically, where you can get your when if you know you can get your money back within eight months or less, then that's this is a strategy that I would recommend. So why is this a good strategy? Well, sometimes, well, when there's quantitative tightening right some some loans are harder to come by some private lenders are harder to go by hard money you don't want to give up any points or percentages and you don't want to give up equity in certain deals sometimes this is a way for you to still be able to do it yourself and be able to acquire the leverage and money to do so right so one of our creative tricks that we use for a lot of our clients um that when that are in real estate when they're looking to get into funds um teach them how to leverage business credit cards right um, there's another cycle to this. If you really want to want to get it to another level, it's called cycling debt. So when you know reporting dates of your credit cards, you can keep moving the debt over and over to different cards as long as you have decent sized limits and you'll still have 0% utilization the entire time, even if you're borrowing 50, 80 or $100,000 at a time. Right. Um, but this is very, very big for you guys, especially in the real estate space to make sure your profile stay ready and fundable um, and, you know, keep leveraging, keep making money. Man, I love it. Guys, this has been great. You guys are, are rock stars. Thank you so much for all this information. I learned a few things today. I always learn some, something new. Uh, but I'm sure that the rest of the group has taken tons of gold nuggets away. Let's open this up for uh, a Q&A, if you guys don't mind. I know we've had a lot of comments, and you guys have done a great job um, of answering some of these questions over in the chat. Um, oh, and by the way, guys and girls, you can book a free consultation with Felix and, and Daniel, there's a link. I just posted it in the chat. Um, go book yourself a free consultation. It's not going to cost you a dollar just to talk to these guys and learn more. And if you want to work on your credit, they can help you. If you want to increase your credit, they can help you. If you want to uh, get some business funding, they can help you. These guys are, are rock stars and they can help you. So when we're jumping into the Q&A here, Feel free to turn your camera on, unmute yourself, and just have a conversation with us, guys. It doesn't all have to be done in the chat. We love talking to you all. We love seeing you. So again, if you have a question, just throw it out at us. We're here to help. Felix or Daniel, how you doing? Dave, how you doing? Thanks I'm doing you. awesome, man. What's going yeah. on, Mr. Steven? How are you, yeah. sir? Doing well, doing well. Good question deal. for you. Um, I did tap into business credit. I, I, I just refied on an investment property. And then I realized I could not use American Express because um, they flagged me. You can't use it for real estate purposes. Uh, and I tried to use that. Through, you were trying to use it through the day of the refi. You yeah, 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 the day of the table, right? right? Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. I'm all, I'm all new to this, right? It's so okay. I, I'm it's learning. Okay. I'm right. learning, like you said, do it a week before, which I know now. And I did use uh, um, Chase. Chase gave me a, I have a $20,000 limit with Chase. I was able to tap into 18000 and I used that through Plastique. So my mm -hmm. question to you is, what, I see you have the three business credits here, you know, U.S. Bank, City Simplicity, and the Chase Freedom. What These other, are just some, some examples of many, many, many. Right, right. right. What other business credit cards do you highly recommend and I, I like the hack that you mentioned I, I just need to get that again using it as a merchant account because that's another way of going through it without you know going through like plastic or, or milio yeah um, without triggering the banks basically right without triggering the banks <laughs> correct correct yeah well, i can go through that part again I, why don't felix why don't you go over some of the cards i think you have an example of a client some of the cards we use but also keep in mind every client profile sequence is different uh based on what side of the country they live on and what their profile looks like yeah so so to give you a prime example and we specifically focus on just like business credit card funding so what we do is called business credit stacking we're basically applying for a bunch of business application one day so our you know, sometimes we can combine hard inquiries on these application and it will get us and maximize the result that we get on the business end, right? 
for you guys to understand what business credit card to apply for, I normally recommend banks that you already have a current relationship with and then tap into some of their business products. The banks that you, yeah, the banks, you want to prioritize the banks that you have a relationship with just because in their system, they already have all of your business information and personal information. And just because the relationship is already built, they're most likely to give you some sort of high limit approval in this case, right? Secondly, what I would do is go on something called bank branch locator, put in your zip code and look at the different credit unions or regional banks within your area. Keep in mind, regional banks, credit unions, these are pretty much, some of them are nonprofits, but some of them are pretty much based on community members and they don't have shareholders behind banks like Chase, Bank of America, where those are backed by shareholders and that's why they're listed on you know, uh, the stock market in the first place. So they are for profit. So community banks, regional banks normally will go above and beyond as a consumer that's coming in asking for money because they're for the community. So I will classify and prioritize those type of banks on top of the banks that you have current relationships with, right? And then secondly, to answer your questions, um, how do you liquidate you know, your credit lines into cash? Um, one way is through balance transfer checks. So when you apply for a business credit card product or a personal credit card product, sometimes these products comes with something called balance transfer checks. It does cost like two to 3% to liquidate the money into a check and then put it into your checking account. But some banks or some products are able to offer on top of you applying for it. Secondly, what I typically do is I would have my other company invoice myself and I would use my business credit card to pay for that invoice and have that money deposited into my other business checking account and wire the money back to me. Right. So now I'm not actually using the cash advance feature on these business credit cards where sometimes it can go up to like 23 to 30 percent. Yeah, right? they charge a lot more for that. Yeah, so you yeah. just got to backdoor it. Yeah. And then lastly, we do have a partnership with this law firm. So basically, they do the invoicing route as well, uh, but they charge like 6.5%, right? But my concept of paying for fees is just like, if I pay 6.5%, I know for a fact, once I get the money and I get into a deal flow or invest it back to my business, I'm making 30 to 40% more. For me, it's all about time and then how fast I can execute and implement, right? Yep. Okay, I can't agree more, guys. You're you're sometimes you're gonna have to pay some fees. It's just part of the game. But if you're gonna pay five grand in fees to go make forty or fifty grand on a deal, who cares, right? I mean, and I you know, and it might not even be that much. It might only be three hundred dollars, right? It just depends. Yeah. But you know, you, you just you want to increase that final financial IQ, and this is where we can start right here today. Yeah, I love and it. Let alone the sign up bonus that you get from these business credit cards that offsets the fees, right? So that's the go. way that I look. I was like, I get a fast, it offsets the fees for my sign-up bonus. What's there to lose? Right. right. Love that. I love it. Very cool. Good awesome. questions. And then uh, I wanted to see here, I'll make sure, Stephen, I'll make sure I go over the strategy one more time to liquidate in, or, and through a merchant account. Uh, but I want to make sure we hit some of these questions that were asked earlier. So for disputing, Jordan, so you dispute the same way, whether it's your FICO or Vantage scores, it's still to Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax. Um, there's just ways to dispute through letters, through fax, to CFPB. There's a lot of different ways. Um, and this is why most people have a hard time getting off their stuff off their report because they don't know how to do all of them at the same time. And it's also hard to keep up with everything at the same time, right? Uh, so just keep that in mind. Um, more than happy to help out on that. Thomas, same thing. Uh, you most likely have an issue with removing those collections because of all those inquiries. So keep in mind, all those inquiries are you verifying your information. So every time you apply for credit, you're putting in your address, your income, your job, all of that stuff is used on the collections to stay on. So you want to clear that off. You want to clear off some personal information before even trying to dispute anything. It makes it a lot easier, right? And then um, do what else? Um, I can go over the merchant account strategy one more time, but if anyone has any other questions, I'd, we can go over that first. I do have a question. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, yes sir. All right. uh, first of all, thank you, David, for organizing the event. I'm very thankful for this. I appreciate it. I'll be listening to all the, you know, all the information. And guys, uh, I do appreciate you too, Felix and uh, Daniel. And I plan to, can you tell me or us, uh, what documentation should I have ready or what information I should have ready to meet with you? Because I'll, 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 I'll accept the, the offer. I'll plan to, you know, uh, having you advise me. 
because I think this is really important. I mean, I never care about things like this, <laughs> but now I do. And so please uh, let me know what the information of what documentation you like have ready for when we meet. It's a good yeah, question. So Guys, what, is, what does he need to have when he books his call? He's going to book his call today. And then when yeah. he comes to that call, what's what, what, what would be a good, you know, set of things to kind of have prepared for you guys? Yeah. So, so if your objective is to get like business credit card funding, for example, then what we need is full access to pretty much what your FICO 8 scores is. It's not what Credit Karma is showing because that's a vanish score, but you want to specifically focus on the score that lenders pull on when you apply for business credit card, right? And then one way you can find that is on Experian.com. You pay a dollar and you get access to all three of your credit report and you get like a seven day free trial, which you can cancel afterwards. So I'll recommend going with Experian and then also notating, you know, um, making sure that your business is in good standings, right? So a lot of times people kind of like disregard what the status of their business is. So one way to check that is going on the secretary of state and seeing if your status is active or it's kind of like dissolved or it's unactive and you want to make sure you maintain that status of being active before um, applying for any sort of like financing in this case. Yeah. yeah, great question. But really, at the end of the day, guys, um, you know, these guys are here to help. So if you don't have all that prepared, it's not the end of the world. Um, I would still suggest booking a call and, you know, just talking to them more personally on a personal level about what your goals are, because really what these guys are going to be able to do to help you is put together the plan so you can achieve the goal. All right. One of my favorite sayings is a goal without a plan is a dream. And I meet so mm. many dreamers every single day that say, I want to do this and I want to do that. And maybe someday, guys, don't have that mentality. Setting goals is important. Don't get me wrong. I want every one of y'all to have goals set. But what's more important than the goal is the plan. How do you, how do you plan to achieve the goal? And Felix and Daniel here are going to help you put that plan together so you guys can take the first step and then the second step and the third step. Don't worry about the 16th step. It's irrelevant. Put together that plan so you can take the first step. And over time, you guys will achieve that goal. It's very, very simple. A goal without a plan is a dream. Love that. <laughs> it is. It's so true. It's one of my favorite sayings. Keep that in mind. All right. Good deal. Good deal. Great questions, guys. You guys got another five, 10, 50, five to 10 minutes, give or take. I don't want to keep you. I know your time is very valuable here today, gentlemen, but looks like we're, we're having some good questions here and I want to make sure that we can maybe ask a couple more. Sure. Well, while I wait for another one, another one to come in, I'm, I'll go over what I did say earlier. Cause I know it was sure. a lot. I know I did it kind of quickly, Yeah. Um, but just so you guys can kind of see it here. Um, all right, let me know. Can you guys see the screen? Yes, it's loading up now. You got a whiteboard, it looks like. Here we go. Yep. We're gonna <coughs> I'm not I'm not Picasso over here, all right, guys, but we're gonna we're gonna make it happen anyways. All right. So um once you have the first step is that business credit card, okay. Um, and then before doing anything else, you wanna have usually it's like a partner or you can do uh, a good friend or something like that. It doesn't have to be anything crazy. And again, the reason why this works is because it's a business credit card that only reports to business. So you're not altering their personal credit report or doing anything wrong there. And you're not going to mess it up by having high utilization. And if for some foreseen unforeseen reason you messed up and it went to collections, you can just remove them as an authorized user as it wasn't their responsibility to begin with, right? So you would add an authorized user, okay? Once the author's user is there and you have their account, now you go ahead and use your merchant account, whether you use Stripe or whatever merchant account you use, and that's where you invoice them, okay? And you invoice them there and you've invoiced them whatever funds you need to take out. Now, if you need to pull out 50,000, should you pull out all 50,000 at once? No, probably not. You can do it in two, three charges. Um, very doable that if you have a higher ticket business, you're consulting, you're in real estate, makes sense, right? Makes sense. So once those funds go to the business bank account, okay, BB, right, business bank account, then from there, the distribution goes to either you as an executive owner or you as an employee, right? So whether you're paying yourself as a W-2 or as a 1099, this really has to do with how you're qualifying for a loan. So if you're qualifying with bank statements, then paying yourself as an executive owner is pretty easy. Or if you're paying yourself as a W-2, you got to put it on payroll. 
either way is fine. And then that usually dictates what type of loan you're going to be applying for. But the funds are seasoned, right? So even if I pull this money a week before my closing date, they're not going to stop my closing because of it. They know where it came from. It's not magic money that made it from nowhere, right? It's from my business that's been paying me money that I have history on that I have the invoice for. So because of that, this makes sense. And there's no flags triggered to any merchant accounts or business credit cards. Yep. I love it. And guys, don't think that you need to leave this training knowing every little thing. That's not the point. The point is just to give you guys a high level overview of what you should be aware of and how Felix and Daniel can help, right? So obviously we're learning things here today. That's the point. This is a free real estate school training. And again, guys, thanks for being here. You guys are rock stars. Thank you. Amazing. But they are here to help you behind this training and beyond this training. So book a free consultation with these guys so they can connect with you on a personal level and talk directly to you about your situation. Every one of us here are going to have different situations, right? And I've used credit cards, by the way, to probably buy two to three dozen houses. All right. It is an amazing approach. Do not discount it. All right. My first probably 10 deals that I bought were with credit cards. And I am so grateful for those credit cards and that opportunity, because at this point, boom, I got great credit and, you know, I'm, I'm rocking. But those were so crucial to me in the beginning to help me get going and, you know, not, not even to just buy deals, but to help fund marketing, right? This is a marketing business. Anything mm. we do in real estate is a marketing business before we are considered investors, all right? We got to market our business. So sometimes having a little capital injection, a little cash injection into our business so we can then go send some postcards or build the website or do whatever it is that we're going to be utilizing to generate leads and get our phone ringing is so important. Amazing. All right, you guys got time for one more. Again, I want to respect your time today. Guys, you can get more of their time by booking a call. But let's let, let let's go with one more question and then we're going to wrap it up. Who's got one they want to they want to jump in? Again, just unmute. I appreciate it. Thank you, David. You're it's welcome. Emily. Thanks for being uh, here, buddy. I, I, first and foremost, I want to thank I want to uh, welcome. Uh, so real quick, and, and, and I apologize. I'm at my W-2, but I was like tapping in here and there. And I'm, I may have missed like some of the information and I don't want It'll to be a replay. That's a question that was already uh, re answered. Um, so, so where I'm at with this, like, so I have an LLC, I have the business, I have like three business credit cards and I actually got approved for five AMX cards. Uh, like I did the AMX play and I got approved for like five of them uh, last week. And it's around probably like, 12,000, but I'm just trying to think like, is it okay to, um, like, what's the best way to leverage your personal credit? Like, even though having, like, so my on my business side, I only have like 15K, right? Like, I got the AMX Gold, and then I have like Chase Inc., and then I have um, Wells Fargo, which is like about 15K combined. But um, I'm just trying to think like, I have more funds on my personal side than my business side. And again, like essentially what I'm doing is what's the business, right? They like it's property management. So I, I got a I got a duplex. Um essentially like I, I created um it's owner occupied, but I, I created a multi family. Like so I have a multi family and I'm and I'm the landlord, but running the business out of that. So like again, sure. trying to grab more uh, doors. So um yeah, so that's essentially where it's at. And I'm just trying to think like how do I leverage this personal credit. Well, I'm going to let these guys answer because they're the pros. I'm not, but I would guess they're going to okay. say you probably don't need to leverage your personal credit. You can just get more business credit. But again, I don't know, guys, what do we got? So What's the uh, answer I, to that. I, I heard something. Uh, what you want to focus on is building the data points prior to leveraging. So you mentioned something and Felix will add on to this, I'm sure, but you mentioned like the gold card and Amex and things like that. So we don't consider those cards parts of funding. Not that they're bad cards. They're great cards for travel and points. But the problem is because there's no present spending limit, there's no limit reported to your credit bureau. So that means there's no data point for it. So you can have two gold, two platinums. You can have all these things, but only the ones with the set credit limits are the ones that are going to help your data points for how much funding you can acquire. And that makes so sense. Focus on those cards and get those limits higher so you can actually get higher business credit card limits or higher personal limits in the future. That's don't go I'm canceling doing. those cards though. Yeah, you don't guys will agree with me, right, on that? <laughs> yeah. Keep just them. because <laughs> they may not be the best. Here's the thing. They're not bad. They're just probably no, not, not the all. best 
thing, right? They're not they're not the, the, the ideal thing. These guys can help you set the ideal ones up. But don't go canceling those cards because we just saw a minute ago that length of credit matters, right? So sometimes we can have these other ones that are just hanging out there. We might not even use them that often, maybe once or twice a year. And sometimes what I'll do with my credit cards is if I haven't used it in three or four months, I'll buy, I'll buy something from the gas station or the grocery store with it, 30 bucks, whatever, pay it off. That way it shows that I'm revolving on it. I'm not just having it sit on the shelf too, right? So, but that's a great question. Great question. Yeah. Daniel, and, and I didn't mean to interrupt you, my friend. Oh, you're good. I was going to see if Felix had anything else to add to that. Yeah, yeah. So just to add on, like, here's another thing that a lot of lenders look at, look at when you apply for, like, business credit cards or personal credit cards. They use something called comparable credit. What they basically do is take the average of all your credit lines that you have in different revolving account and just average out of those to give you the type of credit limit that you might be responsible for or they might be able to grant you for, right? So knowing that, the, the reason behind it is because banks, they never want to be the first bank or when they lend money to you, they don't want to be the first bank to issue you the highest credit limit in that case. In order for them to mitigate risk, they want to match whatever credit limits that the other lenders have given you and then probably possibly give you a little bit more just to take your business, right? So knowing that, I fully optimize my personal credit lines by asking for a credit limit increase. So when I do bring it to a different lender, I can be like, hey, you know, American Express chases, give me 30,000 credit lines on the business. And you're telling me you're only giving me 10,000. How does this make any sense? You want to get my business. You want me to build a relationship with you, either match it with me, or I'll just, you know, commit my relationship with a different bank in that case. Right. So you're sort of, sort of kind of like blackmailing them, but use it to your leverage <laughs> if you have like good credit. Right. Cause you're in it's the legal way of doing it. Right. It's the legal way. Of it's doing the legal it. way. Yep. Yes, Everything sir. is negotiable, right? Your interest rates, your late payments, anything can be reversed. We just need to have that mentality where, you know, you as the consumer have the leverage point when it comes to negotiating with the banks and you want to take that into full advantage on your end. Amazing. Uh, I appreciate that. And I, and, I, and I do want to respect the time now. And, and it's funny because the game, the AMX, um, like five of them on the personal side, but then I was like, um, you know, I tried to apply for another business card on, on, like another AMX card business, I think it was like Blue Preferred and they denied it. They were like, yeah, not right now. So, you know, I'm actually working with Credit Suite uh, and they were like, you know what, you need to add more trade lines. You know, uh, you need to add some more trade lines to your account, build, build your fundability, and um, then you'll probably be able to get some more credit, credit business credit cards. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm learning, but I'm definitely yeah, it, it's really understanding the, the client reason in the first place, just because there's so many variables that plays a part of why you were the client, but understanding those variables is going to help you bridge the gap to what you need to fix on first before going back to the bank, right? So a lot of times we will be under the impression, okay, might not be my credit score. It, it might be my credit score on why I'm getting declined, but the bank might give you a different reason why. And as long as you fix that one reason, then you go back to them and say, hey, you know, I fixed it. Now there should be no reason why I get declined with you guys from this point moving forward, right? So understanding what the decline reason is, is going to help out a lot too. I love thank it. You. I love it. Mm -hmm. Guys, thank you all for being here today. It's always fun when we can get a good group together and put our heads together, learn new things. And, um, you know, obviously today's topic was credit repair and business funding. Uh, I want to shout out to Felix and to Daniel and give these guys a huge thank you for taking time today to come talk to us and teach us. They also have, have been so courteous to allow us to book a free consultation with them. They have an amazing product to help build our credit and to, and to achieve business funding so we can get our businesses off the ground or maybe just get a little cash injection to start funding some of the marketing, right? Whatever it may be, everyone's going to have a little different goal in mind. But like I said earlier, these guys are going to be professionals at helping you put together the plan so you can achieve that goal. So guys, thank you so much for being here today. Don't forget, book a free consultation with these gentlemen. This call replay will be over here in real estate school. And I think we've had three or four people join real estate school since the damn call started. We're kicking yeah. butt over here. Love I it. love it. We're Ooh. growing. We're growing like crazy. I, I got a goal to take it to 10,000 by the end of the summer. And I'm confident I'm going to hit it. I only got about 90 days, maybe 100 days to do it. I'm going to hit it. 
So we're going to have a, an amazing, we already have an amazing community. But if you go click on the classroom and then you click on the call replays area right here, all right, this credit repair and business funding will be added within the next 30, 40 minutes. And the call replay will be in here. There's a bunch of other call replays in here that you guys are welcome to go check out as well. But I will get that call replay added in here. I'll add the link in there to book that free consultation. If you haven't already selected it on the Zoom chat here, it'll be in real estate school. And I'll even make a post in there with the call replay and that link so you guys can go and you can book that free consultation. Felix and Daniel, thank you. And everybody else that has attended today, I want to thank you guys for being a part of Real Estate School. I'm determined to make this the best community on the internet for real estate investing. It's not a Facebook group. I can't stand Facebook. <laughs> I love that it's a third party, separate place. Nothing against kid pictures and, and food pictures, but guys, this is for real estate investing. Let's focus on real estate investing. Let's do deals. Let's collaborate. And let's make some money. That's why we're here. I love it. Well, guys and girls, of course, thank you for being here. This is another awesome training from Real Estate School. We'll get the replay loaded shortly. Felix and Daniel, thanks, guys. Thank we'll you so we'll much, be in David. touch Appreciate with you guys soon. You so Have much, a great guys. rest of your day, everybody. Thank right. you. Bye -bye. Take care. Until next time. See you guys. See, we close fast and any time that works for you. Your house don't need it. We'll throw cash. It hits so fast. Don't know what to do. Wanted to care to keep it. No declutter.